Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next Q&A session here with Peter Verhoyen, uh, Principal Pickler of the Antwerp Symphony Orchestra. Peter is co-founder of the Chamber Group Arco Beleno, whom he has recorded several CDs with, Professor Piccolo at the Royal Conservatoire of Antwerp, where he developed the first European uh, Piccolo Specialist Master's Programme, and he's also commissioned several Flemish composers to write new works for the Piccolo. His dedication to contemporary Flemish music has um, meant he was awarded the Fugger Trophy from the Union of Belgium Composers in 2017. So that's a bit about Peter. Welcome, Peter. Hi. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Yeah, um, pleasure. It's fantastic to have a piccolo player give their perspective. Um, and lots of people have sent in very piccolo specific questions for the Q&A today. So that's it should be really fantastic. Good to hear. Yes. So we get stuck straight in then? That's perfect. Yes, let's go. So the first question here is from Michael Wood, and he asks, I'm always interested in people's preferences for makes of instruments. Could you tell us about your piccolo, what it is, why you chose it, and what other what other make would you choose if that were not available? Good. Actually, that, that's actually a very good question because for me as a piccolo teacher, I have to say I'm still quite frustrated uh, because the quality of piccolos uh, that are for sale is not not as good all the time. So you really have to watch out if you go to a shop and to, to, to buy a piccolo. So my, my my first advice would be just don't go there alone. Take someone with you that really knows how these instruments can be, behave because it's like with, with the flute, it's not because it's a 24 karat gold flute that it is necessarily going to be the, the, the right tool for you to use. Um, and about making a choice, I have met quite a lot of, of fantastic professional piccolo players. And I see that um, having the same instrument for a very long time is some something that I see very often. Uh, piccolo, prof professional piccolo players seem not to change instruments so often as uh, flute players are doing. And the reason for it is that confidence on a piccolo is even more in, important than confidence on flute. Because if it goes wrong, it really goes wrong on the piccolo. Um, so from my personal experience, um, I heard very good things about Anton Brown. Uh, that's already 20 years ago that I heard that story and that it was very, very difficult to get a piccolo from his hands. Uh, and I ordered one and uh, I played this, this, his instruments now for more than 15 years already. Um, I was very happy that he shared this fantastic process developing this piccolo, which, which is a piccolo with uh, a C foot, uh, with, with me. Um, I think this is a glorious piccolo. It's so good that it's almost no piccolo anymore. And then we get in troubles again because mm -hmm. I want to play a real piccolo. Um, this is the, for me, my dream instrument. That's my, my old piccolo, you can see. It already starts making some noise because I played so many hours on it, and I'm completely used uh, to to to, um, to the reform shape it it has. That doesn't particularly mean I think all my students should have a piccolo like this because it's very personal, and uh, some people seem to be very happy with the reform style, and others um, are really doing better with with this style kind of, 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 of head, right? This is a Keith Piccolo, it has a non-reform head joint. And that's a totally different way of making the sound. That means uh, when you are a flute professor, you can generally give the same sound instructions to all people, regardless which make of flute they are having. Uh, but as a Piccolo professor, you have to watch out because you might give advice on doing things with your lips and your airspeed and your air support that might not work. Um, so I found it very important to have a piccolo with this style head joint too in my collection. Mm -hmm. um, 
what can you say more about this? Well, I find that piccolos are really expensive. If you watch the difference between flutes and piccolos, the difference is getting smaller and smaller, but still the difference in tube is, is big. There's, you need more, more metal or more silver or gold to make a flute, and still the piccolo is, is, is very expensive. Of course, this is miniature work also, and I've, I have enormous respect for, for these very small companies, which is the Brown Company or the Burg. Art uh, company or the Kiev company. Um, not I, I will not tell them all, but there's a lot of good good instruments on, on the market. Um, and I have a very good relationship with the Gemeinde company too, because I found that uh, with the Siemen Piccolo, they, they make piccolos that have professional mechanisms and also have this option of, of, of the two, two styles of head joints, which makes it's also possible if you don't have the money to buy this professional piccolos to, to still have an instrument that really has a lot of the qualities that the professional piccolos have. Mm -hmm. um, I could tell about piccolo making more. I could talk for an hour. I don't <laughs> know. Um, just showing uh, this this last invention, perhaps, which you, which you can have on a Burkhardt or a Keith Piccolo, which is the vended hole of the of the sea. I think it's it, it's 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 a very small changement to the construction of the Piccolo. Mm -hmm. But when I try this, uh, it makes it so so easy to to bring out the high G on the Piccolo, which sometimes, like in Carnaval des Animaux, is, is a very difficult note, mm -hmm. and it really helps. Mm -hmm. So. That is what you can say about that. So is that specifically for high G or, is, or does it affect other yeah. notes? Yes. Well, there, there's some other advantages, but I have, have to say these ones I didn't didn't try for myself. But if, if this is the frustrating note that you have been struggling so many times to bring out properly and suddenly just making this little little open key there and, and then everything is gets so easy, well, this is the kind of changements that instrument makers make and that can make me very happy too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. And we actually have another question about um, piccolos and that is, um, do you have a preference for a, a particular type of wood for granadilla wood, rosewood, or cocos wood in your instruments? Yes, yes, I do. I have have a strong preference for, and you can see it because all the piccolos here on the table <laughs> all are granadilla wood. They all are are of dark dark wood piccolos, and um, actually, I. Um, don't underestimate how how difficult it is for piccolo builders to buy this this type of wood. It comes from special trees, and I, I had a fantastic presentation explaining how, for instance, the Burkhardt piccolos are made. And I, 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 they show me the pictures when they have to go to collect this 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 type of of wood. Uh, it it takes some time, and the quality of that wood can make uh, the sound of of a wooden instrument stable are not stable. Uh, my personal experience is with, with uh, piccolos with the lighter colored wood, cocos, cocos um, or um, mopane, or this, this other, other sometimes very exotic types of wood, is a little bit less good because I found that the shape of the sound is a little uneven. Like when you bring out the sound on, on the Grenadilla piccolo, it's really, it has this kind of even shape. And when uh, when the, the wood is lighter, the shape might be more like going difficult to make the drawing over, <laughs> but, but but more up up and down. And um, when you talk about intonation, that's still still the most important thing that you're going to to be judged for as 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 a musician maybe as a piccolo player just bringing out the notes without cracking might be the number one thing that <laughs> conductors and other musicians in orchestra would want you to to take care of but but then generally when you have to to play together with the oboe in the orchestra and your sound is not stable then you really can get in, in troubles and my to my personal feeling the gradilo would still gives you the most fair chance that you will be able to help making the, this this kind of, of, of sound the best. So yeah, mm -hmm. my preference. Fantastic. Uh, thank you to Michael for sending in that question. 
Um, I forgot to mention, if anyone's watching live and wants to ask Peter a question, then please comment below the video on Facebook and we'll get to we'll, we'll answer your questions for you live, which would be fantastic. Um, in the meantime, the next question we have sent in is from Eli. And he asks, how do you deal with the difference in embouchure when switching instruments? Well, of course, the, the first way to deal with it is, is to make sure that you don't have unnecessary big differences in the embouchure when you have to switch. Um, and um, of course, then we really go to, to, to piccolo lessons. And I think uh, people have a tendency when they talk about the piccolo or already to put their mouth corners more away from each other. This this mm -hmm. way to build up an unnecessary high tension on the lips at the, at a place where it doesn't matter. So if you put tension here and here, it might give yourself the impression that you're doing all the possible to have the piccolo sound, um, but it's not going to work better. I I think that you should practice the piccolo every day and not too much. That's very strange. That's perhaps different, different than the advice you get from, from flute teachers about the flute practice. But honestly, that is what you need to do um, because um, it has to do with tension. And of course, we are reducing the tension as much as we can, but you're not going to tell me that the principal violin of the orchestra will not have tension in his fingers and hands when he tries to get the highest notes out of, of, of this, this violin. Actually, the tension raises. And I think as a bass player, there's another kind of, 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 of tension. So I have been working on this enormously in, in the past years. And for me, after so many years, this issue about changing never comes into my mind, uh, unless perhaps that we have only one bar to switch the instruments and I'm a little bit stressed if at the same time I have to turn the page. But it's not actually about forming the, the embouchure because I just know how the, this is going to go. And I see uh, basically piccolo playing as some kind of prolongation of, of the flute trajectory. okay? Well, you, you play to a certain uh, register, and then if you want to, to go higher, you just, need, you just take the piccolo, and you go on where you left it. Mm -hmm. At the other hand, I have this strong message to piccolo players that they, they, can, they should really be aware that being awake and almost happy like this, this clarity that you need it when you switch. And um, this kind of face is that is not basically what you will make with your intuition when you hear a very sharp and nasty high note. Um, so uh, when you think it's problematic, you're already going to watch like this. And then when you hear a, a sound that you don't like, you're going to be more like this. And then you can get into this circle where everything gets worse mm -hmm. all the time. Um, when I have to switch from flute to piccolo, but also when I have to wait for a very long time before starting playing the piccolo in the orchestra, which happens very, very, very often, for me an exercise to get to the piccolo mood, just yes, to rub a little bit here, here and here, even doing this to be awake, <laughs> and and then really um, consciously uh, making a faster airspeed. And I find out when you have fast airspeed, uh, a good uh, use of the face mus muscles, then normally uh, switching is not a big problem for me. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. In your... Um in your role in the orchestra, do you often switch between um, second flute and piccolo? Yes, uh, I, I love my job at the Antwerp Symphony Orchestra. There's four players in, in the flute section. Uh, my three colleagues are the most fantastic people you could dream to, to work with. I have to say that my colleague Charlene, um, brilliant French uh, flute player studied at the Lyon Conservatoire. 
she can do everything. Mm -hmm. She's a very, very nice piccolo player uh, too. We work together, like also on piccolo playing. We had good, good sessions working together, doing, for instance, the duets, which you have in Shostakovich and in Berlioz. Um, but she is mainly going for the alto flute solos when they come up in the orchestra. And I'm mainly going to do the, 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 the piccolo bits. Uh, but I, I very often play second flute too, and I love doing that too because then I have my two principal flute players. It's always like a very beautiful present to be able to sit just beside them and enjoying how they sound as flute players. Mm, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question now from Roz, and she asks, um, do you protect your ears when playing in the orchestra against loud sound? Well, I have 17 years of experience now, and this is a constant uh, ongoing process of monitoring and trying to know yourself and see what works the best. And um, I think as a, when you are in the orchestra, normally in a professional orchestra, you will be offered high quality earplugs made to measure with different filters, and you will try them out. And when it's really a Shostakovich uh, symphony or a loud passages in Stravinsky work, um, you, you will have these earplugs ready to use them. Um, but I see with my distinguished colleagues too that they sometimes use them, but not when the big solo comes up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, not when when it's a fantastic production that you really want to enjoy from the beginning to the end. And luckily in orchestra, most of those our productions are, are like this. So some, sometimes when you're getting a headache and you have a bad day and you don't have much to play, it might save you some, some headache or some bad feeling to use half of the rehearsal, the earplugs, and, 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 and put them in. But my personal experience is that it feels a little bit like wearing sunglasses in a dark room. Uh, and then you start watching better with your eyes and you compensate for it and you get even worse headaches. Uh, and I come back to my first message that I, I said to piccolo players, don't practice the piccolo too much on a day. If, you, if you're uh, practicing three hours the piccolo in a small room, and of course, you will get in trouble. Um, I'm a big, big defender of, of um, to, to schools to go there and just demand that they will, would, would give the biggest rooms to the players of the smallest instrument, which at the beginning for somebody that's keeping the door of the school seems to be strange that he needs to have a, a, a big practice room for a piccolo player, but these kinds of things are much more important um, because the constant playing of the piccolo is uh, the, the bit that might get you very tired, but even worse, give you tinnitus or hyperacusis of this kind of ear diseases, mm. which, which are very serious and very difficult to cure. But even then, there is this rumor that when you have tinnitus or hyperacusis that you cannot be helped. Um, I think um, in our country, and I think in your country also, uh, last years people have been developing very uh, good solutions for people in trouble. But you have to go there. If, if you're in the orchestra and you feel real pain and after a concert you have this, this constant ongoing there's a little noise in your ears. You have to go not to see the ear doctor, but real the professor of the university doctor that really can give you the information. Because you're a specialist at doing something and um, you have to be able to listen to the very highest note and play them perfectly in tune. So you need uh, the best possible prof professional coach there too. Mm -hmm. Um, very important subject this is, and, and even uh, um, 
the piccolo players world is a fantastic world we get along very well there's not a real negative competitive atmosphere <laughs> with piccolo players um but we, we we could discuss it and actually we, you will see that that my colleague uh piccolo players might have other solutions and they work but it's an ongoing process and you have to see and feel what works the best for you mm. Out of interest, do you recommend to your students that they wear earplugs in their piccolo practice if they're practicing like something like Shostakovich? Um, actually, no, unless I see in their behavior that, that they're really getting this kind of problems. Well, okay. uh, when you have to play the Liebermann concerti for me in the lesson or 10 excerpts, then already the mental challenge is, is quite big. That's not something that I develop for them, but they develop it for themselves. They come to my lessons and they really want to have po positive feedback. They're, so there, there is some stress there. And I see in their reactions that things are not getting well, then I'm going to discuss it. And again, then the advice more often is to be more intelligent in the schedule of your practicing and more intelligent in the choice of the rooms uh, mm. where you practice than actually um, using the earplugs so earplugs mm. so much. Um, I think it's, it's, for instance, more important to have noise cancelling headphones when you're taking a flight. That is very important. Mm. Um, or even in a train that, that you just, from time to time, you try to get out of the, this kind of... Um, Yes, noise pollution, what, what, what I would, would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, noise that you don't need or, or that, that you would be listening to, to pop music that you didn't decide that you really want to active listening to. I must say that's one, one thing. When I'm driving a car, I never listen to music. Mm -hmm. I try to, to relax from, from this, this overload of noise I sometimes get in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And when we, we are doing the Shostakovich symphonies during the breaks, I'm not going to go in the coffee room where peeping or, to, or people are talking loud. I'm going to lay down and have a little rest or I'm going to get out to have some fresh air. Mm -hmm. All these solutions for me work way better than than the earplugs mm. you still of course need to have them that's for sure yeah mm. great um thank you to uh ros for that question that was really interesting um next we have one from marina and her question is if you were to make a list of the 10 or so piccolo pieces uh solo and chamber music and um, that you feel young piccolo players should know or that are your favorite pieces what would those pieces be yeah, I think that was a really fun question for me too, because repertoire for piccolo is something that has uh, kept me busy a, a lot. And people know that because, yeah, when you see behind me, you have all those CDs <laughs> I've been presenting. And most of those CDs were just presentations of, of um, uh, pieces that people didn't know yet. Okay, well, I have the Merle Leblanc by Demare recording and also the Mike Mower Sonata. I recorded that too, but these are already the, the real the real classics. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I try I try to to bring um, projects with new compositions that people might really like practicing, but also that your audience is going to appreciate too. And so I think if you're a young piccolo player, you have to realize that there's already some kind of uh, red light going on if you tell the people that they should come to listen to a piccolo concert. So they, mm -hmm. they might already say, no, I'm sorry, I have done something else to do tonight. <laughs> so you'd better be, make sure that the program is not too long and there's real good music in it. Now, the next thing then is that for a composer, when they got, get the commission uh, to write a violin concerto or to, to, to write a piccolo sonata, they probably are going to write the violin concerto first. And if they have time, they will also write a piccolo piece. But there are some exceptions. Uh, and these people really wrote masterpieces, actually, that, that I find also when I play, I play them at concerts, that I really can get the attention of everybody. 
Mm. But that's actually not the list that Marina was asking for. <laughs> it was a, a top list of favorite pieces. Well, young people, of course, you have to know the Lieberman Concerto, of course. Um, it's the best we, we've got. I'm not going to say that it is the Nielsen Concerto or the Reinecke Concerto, but it's fan fantastic, it's written fan in a fantastic way. It has very good ideas and it's written by a composer that knows how to use the instrument. It's very challenging because he asked for high notes, but not in, in a way that it's really impossible. And that's going to bring out the worst of the piccolo to people, unless, of course, you didn't practice. Of course, you did, it needs some practice. Lieberman concerto, you have to know. And the Vivaldi concertos, you have to know them too. Um, I find it personally a pity that everybody knows the 443 and people are hardly ever playing the 444 or the A minor concerto. Um, a minor, perhaps because it's so terribly difficult technically. You also yeah. have to realize that Vivaldi didn't write these concertos for us. He stole them, but for good reason, and we can really do fantastic things with it. Though I feel um, I made already two recordings, CD recordings of the Vivaldi uh, Concerto 443, and in my last recording, I added. Uh, five other concertos, even, uh, by Vivaldi. Uh, but I'm still not happy with it, because I think uh, piccolo playing, the level of piccolo playing has gone higher the last years, but it will still not there. If you listen to the re recorder players playing Vivaldi concerto, we lose. They, <laughs> we are doing that better than we do, and we can learn from him and then we can steal, we can try to imitate it, but we should still find something to play it in a more um, convincing way. Mm. So Vivaldi Lieberman, for sure, 10 pieces, that's a long list that uh, <laughs> asking for me. Um, of course, the Mike Mower Sonata has to be there. I have mentioned it already, but this is the kind of, of, of compositions that when you play it, Everybody wants to play the piccolo. So, Mike, thank you once more. I already told you for doing that. I I wish you could write more for us because <laughs> because we still could use a new composition from Mike Mower for, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then comes Tia Musgrave. What a fantastic composer is she is, and I think her her composition piccolo play. Is, is so inspirational, such a good idea also to, to, to make this uh, uh, co um, comparison with the Couperin uh, the harpsichord music. It's an intriguing work and, and I recorded it recently and I'm still very, very, very happy with that. Mm. And um, it's time to mention some Flemish composers. <laughs> then I come to composers that wrote things for me. I have to start with, with my very, very good friend and brilliant composer, Robert Grollo. Perhaps you never heard of him, but he wrote a piccolo concerto and it's actually a masterpiece. Um, I recorded it in uh, with a small um, orchestra, but it's still my ambition to very soon record it with, with a full symphonic orchestra. Um, other pieces by also perhaps for, for, for you in, in the world, these names will not ring a bell, but Piet Swerts is a very good Belgian composer who wrote a composition com um, referring to Maurice Ravel, and it's, it's called Le Tombeau de Ravel. Um, it's an absolute masterpiece. It's a serious sonata for the piccolo with all the ingredients. Mm -hmm. I think young people have to know it. Mm. And then I'm going to again mention a, a composer from the United Kingdom, that's Matt Smith. He uh, wrote a very beautiful piece, um, very elegant sonata. His, he, he wrote plenty of them actually, but his fourth sonata is, is my, my favorite because it's, it's quite sober but an elegant, but, but a very convincing work to play on stage. Hungarian composer Jan Jossi, 
Mm. Might have very good news about that. I cannot still tell it, but I'm I'm talking with him because he wrote a sonata, and I think he could do more. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yes. Keep checking my Facebook page. You might get some good news from that. Mm. And then I also have uh, another Flemish composer, Westerling, solo piece, Meeting a Mockingbird in Texas. Uh, um, it has been played all over the world because it's such a good piece, very short piece. Um, and then I'm going to end what for me is the moment where, where I stop working in more contemporary. For me, the Donatoni piece, Needy, is an ex uh, extraordinary piece, very difficult, very complex. But yeah, if if you are a, um, a professional piccolo player, I think it has to be on your desk, and you have to practice and know what the piece is like. Mm. Fantastic! Uh, there are lots of pieces there that are new to me, so um, mm -hmm. I hope that gives inspiration. I will be happy to give more information because I have been talking so fast, and and <laughs> everybody can can find me easily on Facebook, and I will be very happy to share the information. Mm. Yes. Fantastic. We actually have a question now, a live question from someone watching from Ron. And um, I'll just put that up now on the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. So he says, have you played Alan Stevenson's delightful pic piccolo concerto? Well, even better. Just one moment. Even better. <laughs> I recorded it. Yes. Uh <laughs> I, this is already like an older CD I recorded, which has a, a title, title Britannia, and has music by John Rutter and Frank Bridge and Howard Blake, but it also has the Piccolo, Piccolo Concerto by Stephenson on it. It's the fun thing about this piece, like the Rutter piece on flute, is that you can play it with, with um, um, a string quartet, bass, and harpsichord. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of my favorite pieces, exceptionally beautiful and poetic second movement, uh, very efficient to play on, on, on for, for an audience. They are, I did plenty of, of performances of this piece with my chamber mm -hmm. music group in the time, and I have splendid memory uh, about the piece. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, thank you to Ron for that question. If anyone else who's watching has more questions, please get in touch and, we, and Peter will do his best to answer them. We have another one now from Laura, and that is, what made you decide that you wanted to become more specialized in piccolo as opposed to in flute? Yes, this, this became quite a natural, organic way. Um, uh, I, I'm, one, I'm one of those wind band players that, that just love to play a little solo from time to time. And um, when you want to do that, people are very happy because people very often fail at playing the piccolo. They try it in the wind band. And when you get nervous, um, that's again this going from flute to piccolo thing that comes up. You just forget to change your airspeed. And mm. You don't do this happy thing I was talking about. But I didn't. For some reason, I had this kind of ten tendency. I, I, w I think also as a musician, you have to be to have this quite nervous character to to really love playing the piccolo, and I certainly do have them. Um, when I was eighteen, already thinking about what I could do in music, and I saw the orchestra, and I had some or experience playing in youth orchestras. Uh, I felt that. I would not love to, to do the, the job of the principal flute player. And I would like feel not fantastic only playing the second flute too. And, and that the, the piccolo job was some kind of, of a lovely compromise. Mm. And then they asked me to do like um, magic flute replacements in orchestras and it always was fun. Mm -hmm. Then I, I got this this interest, and of course, then afterwards, when when I I won uh, the audition and got tenure as as a principal player for the orchestra, I found that apart from playing in the orchestra, it would be very a very good idea to 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 build up a, a project around this, um, because like in in every job you can have there, there's. There is a danger when you have to play the same symphonies and, and works every year that you might lose a little bit um, the precision in it. 
So that was a big motivation for me to start working on on, on my my CD CD projects, and I'm, I'm I've actually never regretted that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what stage in your career was it that you decided um, to sort of become a piccolo specialist? Was it when you were a student, or was it later on than that? It, it well, yeah. I think if you <laughs> a young prof young aspiring professional or a student at the conservatory. Uh, I mean, we had just finished our international flute seminar uh, yesterday. So I talked again with with 10, 15 people between 80 and, and 23 of age that were that are at this moment studying in conservatories. When you talk with them and you say, and you just ask, what are you going to do in life? Who has who has the guts or the courage to say like, I'm going to be principal flute player of an orchestra and nobody says that mm -hmm. some people say but everybody knows how difficult it is and you just look if you can can combine your own personal ambitions uh, with what is realistically possible in in the given circumstances and of course i don't think i'm i'm talking in a mystery mystery language now in this corona crisis everybody thinks about even more too much actually mm -hmm. my advice would be if you love doing it and it's your real ambition speak out and just tell it to everybody that you want to, to do that and and be honest about it and go for it completely um for myself when i was 20 Three twenty-four. I made this time frame that I would spend six years to go for it, and if after that I would find out that it was not possible, then I still could do other things in life. And I'm very happy that I kept going for it until I was thirty-two, because that was the moment that there was a point in the orchestra. It was a little bit later, even. Yes, mm. that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's very encouraging as well to young players to know that perseverance is key. <laughs> yes, I really think that 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 helps for everybody. And and um, if if you're not getting the the orchestra job, just being so positive and dedicated to work so hard will anyway give you skills and a personal network with people that everybody is going to know that you're that person that go that goes for it. And perhaps you might up end up being the manager of a music group i i have of my some of my students just are doing this now and they're doing it fantastic way um but the skills that you learn from being um, a piccolo player at a very high level and just taking that risk and sitting there and play that playing that tchaikovsky four mm -hmm. and taking that risk of missing out one note in a solo and then just staying upright it, it gives you a lot of energy and, and skills that you will use sometimes and even for non-musical reasons. So, mm. yeah, why not? Really. We have another live question now from Nandine, and it's about um, another repertoire question. Uh, their question is, have you played Barry McKim's Piccolo Concerto? No, I, I haven't played it, but I <laughs> know it and I love it. It's <laughs> It's it's very melodic, and some of my students have played it too. Um, it's some kind of, of of a concerto that has everything to to be like a very good ambassador for for the instrument, but for some reason it's not very often put on the program with my master students, mm -hmm. um, because like in the musical language. Some, some, at some points, there's some, some softer bits, and um, yeah, dif difficult to answer why they then are going to more choose for the Lieberman concerto or the Avner Dorman concerto, which is also a fantastic uh, piece. Um, it has has to do with 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 the style of 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 the work. But it's it's it sure is a, a very melodic concert, concerto that's very efficient if mm. you want to attract a, attract a, a broader audience. Mm. Nice piece. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, now we have a question from Marina, and her question is: How does the placement of your cork affect the sound and response of piccolos? 
Good. It does. It makes it makes a very big difference. Uh, but I'm not a scientist, <laughs> and um, my to my experience, it's uh, well. You, you don't have an idea how much people have been changing these positions. When you buy a second-hand piccolo, you really have to make sure that you find that cleaning rod that originally came with the instrument, but also the distances that uh, of the marking on on that cleaning rod. They are they are different between different makes. Um, sometimes people lose their cleaning rods and they buy another one from another make and another brand and then this this teacher comes comes over and he checks it and then he he changes the position of the cord and it um, has an even more dramatic effect on the octaves uh, on the piccolo than it has uh, on, on flute but also on the sweetness of the sound and the speaking capacity of the instrument so if you have a piccolo that sounds dead, <laughs> it happens. Some some piccolos are you have to try to get them to life, and sometimes it's possible. Sometimes you might try whatever; it's not 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 going to 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 work. Um, anyway, I think you should you should check if the position is correct, uh, and if not, you should you should discuss it with with a top level professional player and and experiment with with it. Um, of course, the, the, the magnificent piccolos that I have been showing at the beginning of this session, they do not have that problem, actually. I, I check them from some time, times, but everything is, is, is perfectly perfectly in, in, uh, in place. Mm. Have you ever experimented with moving your own cork in your piccolo, or is it just good where it is? I, I did that 20 years ago when I didn't have my brown yet. And I had some Yamaha and second-hand Hamich piccolos, very good piccolos. Mm -hmm. Hamich piccolos, some of them are real brilliant. But but there I I I did some experiments, and main goal was was very often just to find the position where I could bring up out the the top B and C the the, the very high notes, which is still, however you you try to do that, it's still. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a of a delicate operation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another live question from N Nandine, which is I will just uh, put it up. How should I tell? Um, what should I tell my students when they sputter on the piccolo? Is oh. it too much tension? Okay, this is the moment now to to take a little drawing out of my drawing book. Mm -hmm. Just one second, almost there. It's perhaps a little bit a, a scary drawing. <laughs> it, it has uh, four uh, happy Draculas uh, on it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, during during master classes and workshops that I have been giving in schools, I met a lot of people that I I talked about those those happy Draculas. When when you have this. Um, extra noise on your sound and you have cracking notes of course that's the, that's one of the of the most uh, common uh, problems uh, that uh, that you can experience as a piccolo player it always has to do with tension on the wrong spot okay and there goes my ronald mcdonald smile again this one <laughs> Actually, that's the reason. Now, when you do this, you want to make the mouth opening here smaller in this perspective. You want to bring your, your lips closer to, to each other. Now, the lips of um, uh, flute players are very different. Uh, but when you look at my upper lip, it's, it's a very good example about of a very difficult upper lip to manage a good position because it has twice the curve in it here. Mm -hmm. And actually, but that is for 95% per, uh, uh, percent, percent of people, they do have less musculation here and here. That means that when you play the piccolo, you might have an opening here and here, very small. Mm -hmm. You will not hear it when you play the flute. When you play the piccolo, 
it, nothing is going to come out and you will have some kind of a stressful reaction and you will go to that smile that your flute teacher always tried to get rid of this yes. one and then you will have the cracking notes now if if you if you practice to have a little bit more tension here going downward and here and that's my favorite fa um, famous dracula exercise because you imagine dracula's teeth here going down you will find out that you will be able to relax more here mm. and if you have the a good usage of the musculation both sides of, of your your nose and and you work on this every day i have this guarantee that you will not have this sputtering or cracking noises so so often mm. um if you do then there's of uh, the, the the next thing that you have to to check uh, but i'm not going to give a full big lesson here but the mm -hmm. next thing that you could check is if you're not having too much tension of, of with the left hand pushing the piccolo into your lip that gives the cracking sound now if you relax so smiley dracula and less tension mm -hmm. it always works but you have to to uh, remember that when you're going to be in stress and going on stage and wanting to do the best possible uh, concert ever, that you might do this, pushing the big wall again too much to your lip, doing this kind of tension. Mm. Um, uh, and then if you could monitor those concerts, putting a camera very close to you, you will find out actually, and when it went wrong that there's always a very good reason for yeah. that so that's the good news mm. it's not it's not bad luck if you have a cracking note it's the fact that you forgot to do something which <laughs> you have to be forgiving for yourself because uh it's a very delicate instrument so if you make a very small mistake it has a dramatic effect in the mm. you, everybody will hear it but yeah. luckily they also will say like yeah it's a person who plays the piccolo it's a difficult instrument we still are covered with that i have to say <laughs> don't complain when when i i made mistakes in the orchestra concert the 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 audience was always very sweet to me uh, and the reason is when i have a cracking note i try to be positive but it's not because i make a mistake that i have to ruin the evening for everybody in the hall they want to mm -hmm. be positive people when they go to a concert so that's mm -hmm. another very important point of advice yeah thank you that's great then thank you for your question nandine um our next question is um another one from laura do you actively practice intonation and if so how do you go about it Yes, of course. Yes, of course. You ha you have to practice your intonation, and you have to remember that it's never over. The moment that you think that you are always in tune is the moment that you will play out of tune, and <laughs> people will hate it, hate you for it. And the worst thing is if you play out of tune without noticing it, and that is that is possible if you are not working uh, with your ears like being tired like i told like keeping enough time to relax and to be able to actively listen to your intonation you will if you don't do that you will get in trouble um, and the work uh, of uh, intonation on the piccolo there's actually different things uh, which you have to do uh, first, you have to be sure that the piccolo is in tune with itself. So you have to, to know how much uh, changements uh, you need to make in the octaves. Um, so I, I will just take my newest piccolo here, the one that I only got with me a couple of weeks ago. It's a very beautiful piccolo, but I, I don't know the piccolo yet, so if I play the octaves, I will find out very, very probably. I will find out that they're too small, but I have to know 
how much too small they are. So I'm going to experiment with it. Be honest with yourself, if you play in an in-tune octave, it makes you happy, it's diamondy, it sounds natural, it's good. So I never uh, met people that were, that were not able to hear from themselves if their octaves were in tune, unless they were very stressed <laughs> and very scared. But mm -hmm. if you're honest, you will find out. Octave is easy. Then the second thing is you do the broken chords, you do the vocalese. Did you hear that one? There was a problem here. So doing these exercises, I find out the intonation of the intervals. Now, there it's more difficult. People might be wrong in their opinion about intervals. I still didn't talk about tuning machine. I don't know if you realize that, but I find that should come later. Because first, you're going to, to make sure that your idea of intervals also is combined to a beautiful sound. If if you only want to please your tune, tuning machine, your audience is not going to be very happy, I'm sure. So then I try to connect um, this interval exercises to existing melodies, like like this. Because if, if you play intervals in a melody that you know, you will hate it if it's out. Mm -hmm. If you play the Sarabon from the Bach Partita on piccolo and you play... <laughs> it's going to be much more of a problem because you know that piece and you're going to do... by intuition uh, in, and if you work with believing that you have good ears and that you can trust your brain and your heart working together to play in tune this is the basic layer where you're going to build on if you work in, um, in the orchestra and you are expecting problems now after that when you really have to play the Mahler one you're going to put your tuner machine Mm -hmm. You're going to watch if is in tune. But then my biggest problem is that most common used tuning machines are really not working for the piccolo because they after two seconds they come into place in the middle and then the piccolo players this is going to work but you have to realize that um, the listeners are switching off their hearing uh, when it, it's about the piccolo they will stop listening after half a second so they will judge on your intonation uh, on the basic of, of the first half of a second of the note that's different on flute on flute you can you can permit yourself to start but on the piccolo that sounds awful awful and why is that because we listen to the very beginning it's already one uh, octave sharper so we are more nervous with our ears uh, and we are very 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 quick so actually you need a, a tuning machine 
that gives you this information. I, I found I, this app on my, uh, on my phone, which is called TE Tuner, to be very efficient. And on top of it, it's a tuning machine that works with smileys, which com combines the perfect information about um, where you are in intonation with giving you some hint about how to, to, to give a, a beautiful sound. Um, when I was talking about the beautiful piccolo sound, you remember I was talking about this musculation, the smiley musculation. That is one that you can give to people for mm -hmm. free. Because when you smile to people, they will smile, smile back. It's, it's even if they are not in the mood, mm -hmm. something that, that, that happens directly as quick actually as playing the beginning of a note on the piccolo. So that's very, very important too. Mm. And um, I have to I have to say in my Piccolo master program, when we have a lesson that I think 30% of the time, the intonation is constantly evaluated um, because it's a very del delicate instrument. If it's cold or, uh, or hot, it makes such a, difference if you're happy or not happy it makes so much of a difference in the mm -hmm. um what doesn't make a lot of difference uh, compared to flute is actually changing this position for some reason it only makes if you pull out it only makes your sound less beautiful but it doesn't has that that effect so i i have to say when in the orchestra i i hardly ever change the position of of the head towards mm -hmm body of, of, of the instrument, but that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but I find out that changing the tension in your lips uh, makes the, the sound of the piccolo rise with more than a quarter tone. But well, that means that if I play the C in a relaxed manner, or I give tension on my lips, there was even even more than a quarter tone that was al almost a, a semi semi tone yeah difference that you can make just by being a little bit more tense in your lips now how much difference in the tension on your lips do you get when you're nervous or tired um so people sometimes don't understand they come to me and they say well i practice with my tuning machine and now you're telling me that i'm not in tune and then i say well yeah but you're in an other kind of vibe here you're in, there's another tension and you are not much not enough aware about about the fact that when you change a little thing to the big mm. thing it can have a dramatic intonation effect mm. Brilliant. That was a great answer um, there for that was a good question from Rose. Um, we have a, another question from Rose, actually. How do you, um, in your orchestra, how do you divide the parts if there's a, a, a second flute part slash piccolo? If there's a part that's both, um, will the second flute play flute and piccolo? Or will, the, or will we oh, divide? Yes, I think I already mentioned this. We are quite proud about the job we are doing. So, mm -hmm. so for me, not being there when Tchaikovsky 4 is on the program doesn't feel well, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when Chalene is there, not there to play the Alta Flood solo in, in the Daphne, so in, in the Rite of Spring, it doesn't feel well. So we did this like two weeks ago, we got the planning. Well, it's not sure if everything, what is on the plan in September is really going to take place, but we had a look at it. And I took all the productions where the two, two flute players where the second flute is playing the piccolo for sure. Mm -hmm. And we try to be fair in, 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 uh, in sharing the concerts and have a 50, 50% arrangement that the one does uh, not work. Way, way more than the other, but mm -hmm. but it it it's in in the first place always an artistic choice that we're making there. Um, yeah, when there's Beethoven symphonies with two flutes, I, I think it's 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 my colleague that should have the experience of even doing that. Uh, I find that the second flute should not 
be far away from the fantastic uh, experience to do the classical symphony by Prokofiev. Um, I would love doing that too. Actually, it's it's one of my favorites. But uh, but it's 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 fair that that uh, my colleague will have this challenging and 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 um, experience uh, from time to time too. So yes. it never it never is a is a is a big problem actually. Uh, and um, yeah, I think having four players in the section is 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 good. We we manage to to work enough. Um, for sure, it's it's it can it can be. I think people sometimes underestimate how it feels like if if you have to play the Rite of Spring one week, and then a Shostakovich Symphony mm -hmm. next week, and then do the creation of a very modern piece with special techniques the week after, and then being uh, expected to play the very sweet piccolo sounds in in the Bartok Concerto, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Sometimes th things can can feel a little bit crowded, but yeah, we we didn't work with the orchestra for sort of two months. But I, I think I'm missing it much more when I cannot do it. Then I sometimes can feel that it's too much from some from time to time when the schedule is too full. Yeah, that actually leads us onto our next question from Roz. Is and that was um, how has your orchestra coped with the pandemic and are you gradually getting back into things now? I'm very proud of my orchestra anyway. I think it's it's a very good orchestra. I think the vision of the orchestra is great. We just got a new concert hall uh, for four years now. Um, we're enjoying the acoustics, but also the atmosphere of the hall a lot. And... Um, uh, this situation um, for an orchestra management, uh, our CEO, uh, I have been thinking a lot about him because I realized that it is not easy to work with this because there's plenty of question marks there. So he has to keep the situation financially healthy. So he cannot give big promises there. He still has have has to keep the orchestra enthusiastic after standing after the after the project so um and the whole management team and the administration and the artistic team of the orchestra they all did from what i i find to be healthy things just having some community projects having some postings on our facebook page from people sitting at home well a lot of good orchestras had this kind of experiments then inviting our principal players to to give small recitals that were recorded in the beautiful concert hall where we play. Uh, and then we were actually the first orchestra in Belgium to to go on stage again. Um, and that was on the 1st of July. That was the first day that it was possible. Um, it was a two flute section. So uh, my colleague begged me to, she really wanted to play there. And I, I just got the door, but I said, well, you can, you can play it. It's, it's okay with me, but I'm sure going to come and listen. So I, I went there as a listener. So I had to wear the mask and, and there was this procedure. And I saw, I saw some, some very, very scared people there. They, they were like, they really wanted to go there, but they were a little bit scared about how it's, how is the experience going to be? Uh, going to, to to listen to this orchestra it's a great experience it it, it it's um what, what has been heartbreaking for people in the lockdown is the lack of of communication and 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 feeling and seeing what people have as emotions there's no better way to experience this again than when you go to a concert i felt um, we could go to restaurants also a couple of weeks, but that doesn't bring this kind of weird back emotion that I had when I went to listen to my own orchestra. Mm. Wearing the mask, seeing them playing from bigger distances, being challenged, challenged to, to play together and in tune from a longer distance. They didn't have more problems with it than they had before. It, okay. It's it's always difficult um, uh, to play together and to to have a blending sound, and if you close to 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 each other, you might even have the ringing sound of having too much information. If you take some more space, it's different. 
but it's the, the challenge remains the same. And I really enjoyed listening that Dvorak symphony. And it was so good to hear my colleagues on the flute section playing again, just bringing up the sound. It was, it gave me um, a realistic hope that people will want to live this even more. Because, of course, we, we all had the free concerts. I gave them too. I gave free concerts on the internet. Mm -hmm. But, of course, I did this with from the bottom of my heart to make people happy. But they all know that it's much more fun to see me suffering in concerts live than, than seeing the, the, the online version. Because then you, you're suffering because sometimes you think the connection will break or... The, the microphones will not give the natural sound that you that you have. You now the concerns that you have when you go to, to buy a ticket and you go to the concert hall, it's even more exciting because you're much closer. And if something goes wrong, you will notice it directly. And trust me, not so many things go wrong. Mm -hmm. But feeling and seeing that it's not uh so easy or evident that everything goes right is also part of of of, of a good concert experience uh, i might say when when i see when i see for instance my fantastic english player colleague of the orchestra suffering to 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 play that 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 beautiful solo in the shostakov symphony only life you really can experience it so so i'm quite positive and we have our schedules ready. Uh, open air concert in September to start. Uh, less um, big orchestras, smaller orchestras, but well, then that that changes the repertoire a bit. But sometimes for the good because we have some repertoire pieces that we never played. So twenty mm. days. I'm actually reasonably and cautiously positive and mm -hmm. hoping for for good times to come. Mm. That's really reassuring, and I hope that that um, uh, the way forward that your orchestra has found is echoed in other orchestras around the world. Because I'm sure there are lots of people watching who have the same worries everywhere about when the work will come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think um, we've had so many questions, and that's been fantastic. So thank you to everybody who sent in their questions, and a huge thank you to you, Peter for all of your um, knowledge on piccolo playing, repertoire, working in orchestras. It's been really, really interesting having you here for this interview. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's mine. And I hope to hear <laughs> see a lot of you all very soon. Yes. Thank you, everybody. And we'll, we'll leave it there then tonight. So um, hopefully see everybody soon. And we hope you enjoyed the interview. <laughs>